Okay, so we're reading from the book of Exodus. We're going to read chapters one and two. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Roel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? And they answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Roel asked his daughters. 
Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning again, everyone. Thank you very much um, to Sue for uh, reading for us. You want to keep Exodus 1 to open, and you might find it helpful to have the service sheet um, to follow as well. We'll have some uh, slides along the way as well. Uh, it's great to read the whole of those two uh, chapters, longer than our normal uh, Bible readings, because um, the detail of the story is such um, great stuff. It's um, uh, great fun reading Exodus. It's maybe... Is it the only bit of the Bible to inspire its own Disney film, uh, at least one of the few to inspire a hit um, musical? I know the kids have been in, enjoying learning about it this term next door, but is that all there is to it? Is this Exodus of some kind of big sword and sandals epic, or does it say anything meaningful for us today? Uh, well, today we're going to ask four questions um, that God's people were asking about their experience of slavery in Egypt. Um, but questions which actually God's people today might ask as well. Have God's promises failed? Will he defeat his enemies? Will God's saviour rescue his people? Uh, will God remember us? You see, these are questions that they had. And um, because, remember, Exodus is the second book of the Bible. Back in Genesis, um, the promises that God had made, already it looked like they weren't coming to fruition. And likewise today, we can wonder the same kind of thing. Does God still care about his people today? God seems so silent and distant. Uh, can we still trust that Jesus is going to save us 2,000 years since we've seen him? God has promised apparently to bless his people, but many Christians suffer. Uh, life seems hard. It doesn't always seem very blessed. If anything, in an increasingly secular world, it looks like God's on the back foot. It looks like his enemies are prevailing, are they going to win? So see, the questions that God's people are asking back then are very much the concerns of God's people today. Um, so firstly, have God's promises failed? Uh, it seems like all that God had offered his people Israel and us today had not happened. Um, now what had God promised Israel? Um, it's summed up uh, in a way in these verses where God spoke to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. God addressed a geriatric idolater in the desert and gave him three big promises. Um, three big promises that he would give him uh, a people, uh, a special place, and a special blessing. Uh, God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I'm um, so a big country. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And um, there'll be lots of them. And you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who uh, bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And that was the big hope of God's people. A great nation, a blessed nation, a blessing to others, and lots of them at that. And so how are these blessings going when we get to Exodus? Have God's promises failed? Uh, well, um, did you notice how the story began in Exodus 1 verse 1? Uh, we saw God's people arriving in uh, Egypt and they had gone out of the land and they weren't in the promised land uh, where God had promised that uh, he would take Abraham's um, descendants. They were in Egypt. Um, they were not in the promised place as a great nation um, that God had uh, promised them. God said that he would lead them into Canaan and this promised land. So that wasn't where they were. So perhaps it seems like there's no hope. Perhaps they're locked they're out of God's land. They're locked away from God's promise. Um, but in fact, if we've read on in Genesis, we'll know that wasn't the case. 
Because although God did promise he would take his people to Canaan, he always said there would be a detour on the way. Here's verse 15, uh, chapter 15, words to Abraham again. But know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated. And then later on to Jacob, he says, God will make Israel a great nation in Egypt and will then bring them back. So whilst it looks like the promise to take them to Canaan hasn't happened, actually God's, God's route to Canaan is still on track. Because God had said he will bless them in Canaan um, by making them slaves in a foreign country. In fact, in Egypt, and part of his plan to make them great uh, will even mean them being enslaved there. So even when it looks like they're in the wrong place, they're actually on the right track for God to bring them home. And so God is taking them to the right place that he promised. Um, but what about his promise to bless them by making them a great nation and lots of people? In um, Joseph 1 verse 5, um, they started out with 70 uh, Israelites. Um, that's okay, it's not a huge amount, is it? Uh, and then in verse 6, all of them died. That's not a good start. It's going in the wrong direction. It doesn't feel like a great nation. It doesn't feel like they're multiplying. But... Uh, even by verse 7. Uh, the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Remember the promise made to Abraham back in Genesis that there his descendants would be uh, more numerous than the stars in the sky. And sure enough, despite being whittled down to next to nothing, uh, God's people are growing exponentially. And this language reminds us of God's promises to Abraham. But the language in this verse also reminds us of another passage from uh, Genesis. Did he spot it in verse 7? Uh, going even further back than Abraham uh, to Adam and to Eve. And this is what God says to them in Eden. God blessed them and he says, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth. Uh, and all four of those words in bold are picked up uh, in this verse now. So even though it seems like God's promises are not on track, it seems like God's people are, are whittling away. Uh, in fact, he's fulfilling his promise to Abraham, and even more, his, his purpose for the whole creation, his purpose for the whole world is still being fulfilled um, through these people, these Israelites in Egypt. Um, there's a huge amount of them. They're increasing, overflowing, uh, and filling up, filling the earth. Um, so have God's promises failed? What do we think? Are we, are we, have God's promises failed? No. No. Uh, no. God's promises have not failed. God's place is still promised to us. We might not be there now. But even in a broken world, we as Christians today can look to a new creation, just as God's people in Egypt could look to the promised land. And even today, God's people are growing. Uh, the church might seem relatively small in Townsville or in Australia today. Um, but since Jesus Christ, there have been billions of people uh, saved by faith in him. And maybe let's not look at Australia, let's look at somewhere like um, China, where uh, apparently the number of Christians has grown in 100 years from about 1 million to 100 million. Uh, exponential growth of God's people have been, has been happening uh, for years. Uh, God's blessing is still unfolding. God's promises are succeeding. But remember, we said that God was going to bless his people uh, by growing them, by putting them in his place, but also by blessing them. So I wonder if you think God's people are being blessed. Are they experiencing much blessing at this point in their history? Uh, in fact, remember back in Genesis 12, he said that um, they're going to be a blessing to all the nations, uh, presumably in including Egypt. And in fact, God was going to bless those who bless them, but curse those who curse them. So they were going to be good news to the world, and either you had to get on board with that blessing or get out of the way. And so right after we hear this news of uh, exponential growth in verse 7, we get an ominous turn in verse 8. Uh, a new king steps up, uh, a rival, it seems, to the true king on the throne, God. And when it says that Joseph meant nothing to him, well, of course, he would have known about Joseph, Joseph was sort of, you know, like the treasurer or the kind of deputy of the whole nation. He knew about him, but he just meant nothing to him. This new king 
that has ignored God's people and God's leader, Joseph. He's come to power, so to speak. It looks like there's a new contender for top dog on the throne. And more than that, as we read on, uh, we'll see that their blessing seems to be at stake. Remember, under Joseph, do you remember the story? God, um, through his people, Israel, through Joseph, gave great blessing to Egypt. Joseph was the one who, in famine, um, meant that they had an abundance of grain, and Israel could keep being, uh, Egypt could keep being fed through the fam- famine. God had been blessing the nations through his man, Joseph, but now that seemed to be coming to an end. Because in fact, in verse 9, we learn that actually, far from seeing God's people as a blessing, um, this pharaoh, this new king, sees them as a curse, as a problem. The Israelites have become far too numerous for us. See, remember what we learn in verse 7, as they were growing, we thought that was good news for the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham and his purposes to Adam, but it was not good news for them. And the word for numerous could be the word for strong. See, as they were growing in number, they were potentially becoming a greater threat. In fact, it's the same word used later on in Exodus of the swarming flies uh, that plagued Egypt. That's how Pharaoh saw this growing people uh, as a pest, as a growing problem to be got rid of. So we're expecting them to be a blessing to Egypt, but now it's seen that they were being a curse. But God had promised that anyone who was cursed, well, he would curse them. So we're expecting God to put out this king to vanquish this threat. And so what's going to happen? Is God going to bless his people? Or is Pharaoh going to come out on top? Uh, Well, will God's enemies win? And that's our second question. And again, today, perhaps we can think that the powers in the world look much stronger than God today. Perhaps we think they will prevail. See, Pharaoh was really the most powerful man on the planet at the time. Uh, Maybe a Putin uh, or someone like that. That's who God was up against. And so we see um, them go to battle in three rounds, um, as per the handout, to see who comes on top. Will Pharaoh put out the threat, or will God continue to bless his people? Well, Pharaoh has declared uh, war on this so-called threat of Israel. In the first round, Um, He tries to eliminate them by making them slaves. Remember, what was the problem with them? It was that they were growing. And they grow in number um, by getting together and making babies. Um, So he wanted to make them slaves, put them to forced labor, making bricks, um, presumably to tire them out and to keep them occupied so they could no longer uh, grow um, more babies. Um, But in fact, verse 12, his plan didn't work. The opposite happened. Verse 12, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So I'm not quite sure why this happened. It seemed that the brick carrying was some kind of aphrodisiac. Uh, Maybe they've been listening to recent sermons on YouTube or Rostro Anglican and been encouraged to um, make their marriage work. And the maternity ward in the hospital of Goshen was suddenly overflowing. And there were no beds. There were loads of babies. Um, such a wonderful verse, isn't it? The more they were oppressed, the more they mo- multiplied. And God was blessing his people as he's blessed them ever since. Um, that verse could be true of God's people for the past many thousand years. I just think of the Roman Empire. I think of um, this, the great Caesars who are against Christ, against his early followers, uh, who only a few generations later were succeeded by Constantine, who turned the whole uh, empire to Christ. So, probably round one to God, what's Pharaoh going to do next? Well, he takes it up a gear. Remember, the problem is with these boys, these young boys who could become the next army. And so he orders the midwife to kill the Hebrew boys. It looks like a big curse for God's people. But in verse 17, wonderfully, these midwives feared God more than they feared this so-called king. And in verse 19, they managed to get out of killing the boys. Some people get uh, concerned about this because it looks like they're, they're lying, um, the midwives to Pharaoh. It could be that he's, they're just kind of uh, mocking him uh, somehow. Um, God is kind to them. Uh, God seems to approve of what they do. 
And I think all the way through the story, we see that God works through unusual circumstances, uh, even in ways that we wouldn't expect him to do, and through his people and their weak efforts to bring about his uh, blessing. And sure enough, in verse 20, yet again, the people increased and became even more numerous. And so round two, ding, ding, goes to God. Um, but yet again, Pharaoh ups the ante. He doubles down. Verse 22, he gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy must be thrown into the Nile. He cuts out the middleman. He cuts out the midwives and just wants everybody um, to kill their boys. Now imagine the horror. Imagine the horror of being a mum, having your newborn baby in Egypt. We don't get the whole story here. Um, we zoom in on one particular mum and one particular boy. Uh, he's three months old. And this mum can't bear to see her son killed. And so she plans an escape for him. And she puts him in a basket. And out of desperation, trusting God, she lets him go in hopes that someone will find him. And sure enough, someone does. Someone does take this three-month boy and looks after him. Uh, in and of itself, a wonderful sign in a small vignette of God continuing to bless his people. Um, but notice, not just anyone found this boy. It was a princess, a princess of Egypt. And perhaps the mum might have thought she'd never know what would happen to her boy, but the boy's sister was watching. And she comes up with a cunning plan, and she manages to get his mum back in the picture and back with the princess to look after this little boy. And by the end of the story, in verse 9 and 10, this, this boy who was left for dead ends up being uh, looked after and nourished, not in any households, but in Pharaoh's households. Uh, Pharaoh might not know about it, but he's paying for him and looking after this Hebrew boy. Um, just one small story as a sign of God continuing to bless his people. Remember Pharaoh, what, what was he trying to do? He was trying to eliminate all the boys. He thought they were the main threat. But he hadn't counted on the cleverness of the daughters of Israel, who would prove the ultimate problem for him. So, uh, will God's enemies win? What do we think? No. no. Okay, we're nearly awake. Still well done. Uh, will God's enemies win? Uh, no. You see, Pharaoh can't defeat the king of life. You see, all the way through here, Pharaoh's uh, solution is death. And God's blessing all the way through his life, his growth and multiplication, even the most powerful man on the planet, however shrewd he is, can't beat God's people. In fact, he has the opposite effect. The more he oppressed them, the more they multiplied. His people are totally blessed. And that promise rolls on today. God's people are constantly being oppressed and constantly being blessed. See, so yeah, we don't need to fear the great powers of the world. How do you feel about it as you step as a Christian? You feel in the minority today, and you feel like there were more powerful people, more powerful uh, forces uh, in the law, in the workplace, in our culture today. Well, God is always more powerful than them. It's not a new experience for God's people to feel oppressed, to feel in the minority. Uh, God's people have always been persecuted, always on the back foot, and God has always protected them. And so thirdly, will God's rescuer fail? And perhaps you didn't spot a rescuer in this passage, but notice we left the last story with one particular Israelite boy having been protected by God. But notice as we left him in verse 10, we knew that he was going to grow up to become the prince of Egypt. And in this story, in, uh, when his mum put him in the basket, and we know the phrase, don't we, Moses' basket, we think of this little, little papyrus um, uh, basket. But in the footnote in my church Bible, it tells us that the word for basket is, this, is the same word used for the ark, as in Noah's ark, the first time that word is used since that story in Genesis. So if we're reading that for the first time, we notice that, we might think, well, this is odd, isn't it? You don't uh, put a little baby in an ark. Uh, why was Noah put in an ark in the first place by God? Well, it was to save his people, to keep the blessing going uh, through the judgment on God's people, um, to rescue uh, a few out of that judgment and to keep the promise and the blessing going um, despite all circumstances. So even from this boy's birth, we have a hint that likewise, he might be a new Noah, that he might be one to bring rest and comfort and deliverance to his people. But from the story that follows, this slightly odd introduction, we might not have full confidence that Moses is going to be that man. 
uh, from verse 11 to 22. Uh, at first, it seems a good start. He leaves the great palace and comes down back to his people Israel. He doesn't ignore them. Um, but then it seems to take a pretty bad turn early on because he kills an Egyptian. That doesn't seem like kind of hero stuff. And then, in fact, he's not greeted like a hero by his people for doing that. He's rejected by them. And he's on the run. He's rejected by his own people. And then he gets rejected by Pharaoh. And for the second time in his life, he has a death warrant out against him. And he's on the run. And he ends this story as a refugee in a foreign land. So does that sound familiar, that story? Uh, Moses, the man, being persecuted and rejected and being out of his home and on the run. And what happens to Moses is exactly what's happening to God's people, Israel. Uh, he represents the whole nation here as God's man. And then we won't get to go through all the details, but he then gets into a spot of bother with some kind of pretty midnight girls. Um, he gets to marry one of them. He gets to play the hero as well. Uh, and there's some innocuous detail, so it seems. Um, but actually, all of the details in this story work together to show us that God is working through these events to build up this man to be his deliverer, to be his rescuer, to be the savior of God's people, someone who won't just rescue sheep, but will rescue God's people. And there's a diagram on the handout and on the screen there. We don't get to go through all of these examples now. But there's some key words used throughout this episode that are used in exactly the same way of God later on in the story uh, when God steps in to do all these things for his people. And so the keen reader knows that what Moses is doing is something that God will do. And God is acting as the one who will rescue his people. So even though it seems a bit random, even though we leave Moses kind of off stage, enjoying his honeymoon with Zippy in the wilderness, it doesn't seem like kind of hero stuff. But actually, if we pay careful attention, we know that God has been preparing this man to be the one who will deliver his people, the all-conquering prince of Egypt. And so today, likewise, we can have look back at perfect confidence with God's saviour. Um, do you remember who we can look back at? Oh, one who was um, pursued by a murderous king when he was just a baby. Uh, we can look back to one who, who fled to Egypt after birth and was protected by God. Uh, we can look to one who uh, wasn't just a prince of Egypt, but the prince of the kingdom of heaven. And who, like Moses, left the comfort of his kingdom and came down to be with his people to save them. Uh, who, like Moses, was rejected by his people and persecuted by those in power. The one who, unlike Moses, didn't flee danger and didn't run away, but actually walked towards it and stepped towards it, even death. So that unlike Moses, he wasn't one who struck down his enemy and killed them. He was one who struck down himself, was struck down himself and was killed. But we look back to Jesus who can conquer sin and death by taking the punishment that we deserve by dying on a Roman cross and rising again in victory. Uh, it might seem a, a weak thing to do, to, to trust in someone who died 2,000 years ago, um, but we can look back with even more confidence than God's people ever could um, to Jesus on the throne, to his death and resurrection, know that he is risen and ruling. Uh, will God's rescuer fail? No. Uh, we can be absolutely confident that God has prepared his rescuer, that he will return to save us. And so finally, more briefly, will God forget us? See, ultimately, however much God's people could trust in Moses, they need to have total trust in God himself. Is he going to remember his chosen people? Has he just forgotten about them? All the way through this story, it seems like God's been off stage. Maybe he's moved on from these people. Likewise, it can seem like he's off stage today. We don't often feel like we see God acting in power in the world today. These final verses aren't so much a chronological next step in the story, um, but rather they show that God has remained concerned about his people all the way through these episodes. Verse 23, has he forgotten? No, he has, uh, verse 24, he has heard and remembered their covenant with Abraham. Uh, we're pulling back the curtain here on these whole chapters to see that God has been uh, carefully involved all the way through. He has not forgotten. He has listened to the cries of his people, listened to their groaning and their suffering, and is concerned 
He's remembered the covenant with Abraham. And we know that this period of waiting in slavery was always part of God's plan. That it was never the end of the story. And God will ultimately fulfill his promises to have a people, a land, and a blessing. Uh, will God forget us? No, he won't. Uh, what wonderful good news for the Christian today, that God is always acting even behind the scenes, even when it seems uh, weak, even if it doesn't look like the, the path that we would take ourselves to blessing, each and every day, God is actively working through his saviour Jesus to rescue his people and to bring us out of this broken world and to bring us home to be with him and to bless us and to grow us. And he's listening to us, uh, even now in our groaning and our suffering and our crying out to him. Uh, he will bless us. Uh, let's pray now. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much um, for your word to us. We thank you for the richness of the whole Bible that we can uh, read your word to us from Exodus this morning and be encouraged. Pray that we would, uh, as we go out from here, into a world where we can feel small, we can feel weak, knowing that we have such a mighty God with us, one who is uh, stronger than his enemies, one who will prevail, one who will bless us. Pray that would give us real confidence to continue to boldly live and speak for him day in, day out. Amen. Amen.